So it's very comforting after reading the Old and New Testament readings today that Sue read to come to our Gospel reading and to meet Jesus. Who, Even though last year you heard he had some very hard words for us, today's reading he's loving and compassionate and attentive to people's needs and to their weaknesses. In fact, he's willing to stand up against the religious hierarchy in his efforts to bring wholeness and healing to this crippled crippled woman today. The first reading is up here, the Jeremiah reading, um, tells of Jeremiah, that prophet, the reluctant prophet, and aren't they all, (laughs) who said, Lord, I do not know how to speak. Sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send to you and say whatever I command you. Jeremiah was getting a definite call here from God to do something for God. And he was reluctant. He said, Lord, I'm only a child. But most of the prophets were like that. When God called them, It was no easy thing when you read how Moses was called, Ezekiel, Isaiah. In fact, to receive a calling from God and not be humbled and overwhelmed would be almost arrogant. But God promises when he gives the call to any of these prophets or any of us that he will be with us. And God will promise to be with everyone He calls, does not send us out alone. And he said that to Jeremiah. And then there was the uh, New Testament reading from Hebrews, which was fairly overwhelming. If you heard it, heard the words Sue read, they were pretty overwhelming. First of all, it talks about the mountain of uh, fear, which is Mount Sinai, I think. And uh, that was the picture that all the Israelites saw as Moses ascended to that mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. It was terrifying. And I think the next um, passage describes how Hebrews describes that. You've not come to a mountain, and this is what it was like when the Hebrews saw that. This, can, this isn't a mountain that can be touched. It's a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a whirlwind and the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them, for they couldn't bear the command. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. So terrible was the sight. And we hear that's the Old Testament mountain. That was Mount Sinai that Moses climbed in the Old Testament. But we've actually come not to Mount Sinai, we've come to Mount Zion. And I think the passage was called the Mountain of Fear and the Mountain of Peace, I think. So we have come, and this is where we've come as Christians because of Jesus, to a mountain that can be touched. No, next one. Can you go to the next slide? Right. So we've come to Mount Zion. And it's the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. That's where we've come to. And if we're thinking about heaven and heavenly Jerusalem, there's innumerable angels in festal gathering. This is a beautiful picture of heaven and God in all his glory. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We're citizens even now of this heaven. Isn't it wonderful? And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, made perfect because of Jesus, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is amazing. This is written to Christians. It's written to us. Do we ever think of this, what we've come to? God is incredible what he's called us to, but he's called us into his presence And we can come into that presence because of Jesus. But it's pretty overwhelming. The passage finishes by saying that God is a consuming fire. 
And if it weren't for Jesus, we might all be consumed by him. But Jesus has come. And because of that, things will be okay. Because Jesus has come. And we've seen what sort of a person that Jesus is and how he reaches out to seeing our need and our weaknesses. And because of Jesus, we can enter into God's holy presence because Jesus takes us by the hand and leads us there. So it's okay. We can come to holy, holy, holy because Jesus takes us there. And it's so good we get a gospel picture of Jesus today, of who he is, because we know what God's like. Yes, God is to be feared and holy, 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 but God is Jesus. And Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So everything we know about Jesus, that is what who God is. And that's a beautiful picture that we can we can kind of get that because Jesus came as a man to show us. This is the person. This is, this is what God is. And this is Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus, as we see him today in that temp, uh, synagogue loving that woman, Jesus is the love of God tangible. Just look at what he did. He touched that woman. In fact, N.T. Wright, who's a great theologian, if you ever get to read any of his books, uh, Tom Wright or N.T. Wright says this about Jesus. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. And if you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. And if you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama which has him as a central character. So with these incredible pictures of God in, in his, all his holiness, for us as Christians, we look at Jesus and that brings us into the truth of who God is. So as we meet Jesus today in the gospel, we find the same Jesus who shed his blood once and for all in his sacrifice on the cross. And it's the same Jesus who teaches in today's synagogue And he saw a woman suffering. The next slide. He saw a woman who'd been bent over for 18 years. And he called her to him. He called her. That's a different kind of call than we hear from Jeremiah, isn't it? And I don't think that woman was afraid because she saw love and compassion. Someone who wanted to meet her in all her need. And Jesus spoke to her. He spoke words that were freeing from her infirmity. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. He touched her and he straightened out her life. Literally. And she praised God. No one had ever done that for her. And Jesus did that for her. And interestingly, today Jesus took the initiative. He saw her need and he healed her. When we talk about Jesus healing us, he didn't just have a set service that he pulled out of the prayer book and said, I'm going to do the healing service today. It wasn't the same every time he healed. In this instance, he saw the woman and he called her to him. He took the initiative. She didn't really even ask for healing. But he took the initiative. He saw that she was broken and he healed her. But in other instances, people cry out to Jesus, Oh, Lord, have mercy and heal me. And he heals them. In even other instances, friends bring a paralysed friend and drop him through the roof so that Jesus can heal him. So friends bring their their, um, sick friends to Jesus for healing. So Jesus doesn't just stick by the book. He wants to heal however and wherever it can happen. And even if the person themselves may not ask Jesus for healing, we as friends can ask for healing. And even if they don't ask for healing, Jesus may see their need and heal them. 
Jesus heals, as in this beautiful example today. He saw her suffering and he had such compassion on her. And I think that's actually, isn't that what God's done for the world in saving us? I think the world's still calling out for a saviour, but the saviour has come. They don't realise. God has already reached out in his initiative, sending his only son, Jesus, to come and save this world. Don't wait for another saviour. Don't look for another saviour. The saviour has come. Jesus has taken the initiative. God sent his only son. Because God looked at this sad and broken world. Still, I'm still focus on the woman, I think. And he calls and speaks words of freedom. And he touches us and we are made straight. If we look to Jesus, he's calling us now, maybe touching us. He makes us straight. And we get healed and we praise him, just like that woman. If you find healing coming in your life, thank God for it. Jesus is healing you. But the religious hierarchy disapproved, as, as they so often do. And not just then, but now. Jesus didn't fit into their box. In fact, they probably didn't realise that God had at last sent the saviour that they were all waiting for. And they wanted to stick with their tried and true rules. They wanted to stick by the book. No healing on the Sabbath. Don't come to church and do anything different from usual. Don't let God's Holy Spirit be allowed to move and heal and change and save. No, let's keep things in the box under our control so that we know what's going on. That's what they wanted in that synagogue that day, didn't they? How, you know, how dare you heal on the Sabbath? But Jesus calls them hypocrites. Hypocrites. You say one thing and you do another. You untie your beast and you lead it to water on the Sabbath. Yet you won't set this woman free on the Sabbath. They were put to shame and the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that Jesus was doing. The religious hierarchy were put in their box, <laughs> in a sense. Because with Jesus, love must always find a way, even if it upsets our religious sensibilities. And the next slide says that Jesus does find a way. By his coming, we can find a way to God. Even though meeting God might terrify us. In fact, the first two readings demonstrate that. God is a holy God and meeting God is not to be taken lightly. Fear, fear the Lord, it says in the Bible, doesn't it? Fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, fear is not fear as in the tremble and anxiety that we often, so often feel as humans. This fear is talking about having a holy reverence for God. Respect him, honour him, and let Jesus lead us into his presence, God's presence. Because this God calls each one of us, just like Jeremiah, just like Moses, just like Isaiah. He's calling each one of us. Sometimes it's to big things, like Jeremiah, and sometimes it's little things. Ring up your friend who's suffering. Um, write a letter. Sometimes there's little things, but God's calling each one of us. Have no doubt about that. We all have a vocation to God. We're all being called by God to something, big or little. And he will equip us to do what he wants us to do. And if we enter into God's holy presence, Jesus will need to hold our hand because it is awesome. It's, a, it's an unshakable place. And we will need Jesus to lead us there. He'll stay close to us. Don't worry. He's right with us now, here. And he's going to keep leading us on into eternity to that wonderful place that we really look forward to, those angels in festal gathering. What a picture of heaven. So as we meet and we walk with Jesus in the Gospels, we can know that we're safe and we're loved and we are held. And we led into the most glorious now and the most glorious future because Jesus walks with us. So let's just close our eyes for a minute and just imagine that. 
Just imagine that Jesus is sitting there with you now with his arm on your shoulder and loving you. Maybe he's straightening you. Maybe you're feeling bent in lots of areas of your life that you need healing. He's there. He sees it. He wants to heal you and straighten you and save you. Maybe you find it hard to pray. Jesus will take you there. He'll lead you there. Just sit quietly in his presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you do stand among us. You do walk with us. You're behind us and before us. You completely surround us. May each one of us now know today and on into the future that you walk and walk with us, taking us and leading us into the presence of your glorious Father. We thank you, Jesus, because everything we do is in Jesus' name. Amen.